Welcome everyone to Open Office Hours. This is the time where we get together every month to break down different startup concepts uh, to help you gain traction in the most important parts of your business. And today we're going to talk about how your product teams can have a bigger impact on the growth of your startup by better understanding your product and business metrics together. Um, so first, we're going to talk about discovering which metrics can unlock that growth. And then we're going to dive into how to structure your product teams to focus on making an impact on those metrics uh, instead of just shipping new features. But before we get started, if this is your first time joining, be sure to subscribe to our channel um, because next month we're going to be continuing this discussion around uh, continuous discovery and delivery loops for product teams and how you can kind of put the, these things into action. And these lessons are from our free Ready to Scale video series. I'll drop a link uh, in the chat as well as in the description for this recording so you can check it out if you want to. Um, so my name is Jacob Miller. I'm the marketing and brand manager at Headway. I help host events like this every single month. And if you ask questions on social or in here, I'm usually the one replying. So hello and uh, welcome. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to um, Andrew and then uh, Ryan for introductions. Yeah, thanks, Jacob. So I'm a Andrew Vermicore, the partner and CEO here at Headway. And um, you know we've been hosting these now, I think, for a year and a half first on Zoom and now on, on YouTube. So excited to be chatting and digging into some really cool topics. I mean, this obviously comes from our video series, but also things that we just think are really good fundamentals for building customer-led, product-led companies and really understanding where you're gonna focus. So I'm excited to dig in and I'll pass it over to Ryan. Yeah, welcome everybody. Uh, Ryan Hatch, head of product here at Headway. Super excited to talk to you about um, our topic today, which is metrics and empowered teams. Um, it's one of the most powerful, impactful things you can do at your startup um, to win and to get to the growth you need. So we have a video series called Ready to Scale. Um, some of you in the audience might have already seen this, but feel free to sign up for this. Uh, it's a great video series. Um, and what we're going to be doing is walking through two things today. We're going to walk through the right metrics and empowered teams. So let's get started. Let's talk about right metrics. I think this is the one of the most important things, again, for for your team, um, there's a lot of metrics out there, right? There's ARR, MRR, recurring revenue, signups churn, ARPU, active users, there's burn growth ratios, there's all sorts of metrics. And it can be it can be overwhelming. You know, how do I measure success of my team from an investor standpoint? But then also, gee, how do I actually make this stuff actionable for my product teams, right? What are the right metrics for, for them to do? And what are the right metrics for us to do reporting on? So those are different things. I think that's one of the main things we want to talk about uh, and cover in this presentation is, let's say, investor type metrics, business level type metrics, and product metrics, and how, and how vastly different those are, but how connected they are together. So the... Let's let's start back where we started with, you know, the last presentation we did was all about customer segmentation and really understanding, hey, who are our best fit customers, right? Who in our um, in our product right now are really great customers that we want to have? Who are the customers that really aren't qualified and we, we really should have there be better served somewhere else, right? So the customer segmentation is kind of like a prerequisite, if you will, kind of coming into uh, to talking about this. Once you've really gotten your customer segmentation down, you understand, you know, who your customers are, the context, you understand the problems they're struggling with, um, then you know, you also understand the desired state, right? This is kind of an introduction to jobs to be done here is you have the customer on the left in their current state and the customer on the right in their desired state, right? And you're trying, your product is trying to bridge that gap from left to right. Your product's playing in here and trying to get them to this desired outcome. So when we think about this through the customer we, we, what we often do is come at it with um, a business lens. I mean, a lot of you are probably familiar with uh, funnels and, and pirate metrics models, right? And you can see that there's, there's the marketing side on the left that talks about awareness and acquisition. And then there's inside the product, whether you're product led um, or not, you're dealing with things like activation and engagement. And how do I, how do I actually monetize and get, get to revenue, right? Is it freemium or whatever? You're trying to pull people through this journey uh, in your funnel. How actually, how do we get them to stay, right? How do we retain our customers over time? How do we expand and upsell, cross-sell? You know, what are the, what's the revenue expansion uh, uh, strategy? And, and then what's our, what's our virality? You know, how do, we, how do we use network effects? How do we actually go beyond just paid media uh, for, for our growth? So um, when you think about this, 
there's a couple metrics that um, you're probably using already. There's a lot of the metrics that we talked about. One of the things that uh, often in you know subscription companies uh, that we use is you know unit economics, and I'm assuming that. A lot of you have already heard of these things. If you haven't, unit economics is all about asking the question. You know, you can look at uh, profitability at a whole business level, but that's actually a mistake. Uh, what you want to be doing is look at profitability at an individual account basis. If you're B2B, uh, individual customer basis. So that's where unit economics come into play. So you don't only just have a break even on the company uh, itself. You actually have a break even on each individual customer. Right? Right, and those two components are the cost component of of acquiring a customer is the acquisition cost, and then you have the profitability side of the customer, which is really about lifetime value. The challenge here is that lifetime value, you know, and then there's standard ratios for these things. Um, so if you look at uh, David Scott, um, you know, the LTV to CAC ratio um, needs to be three to one. Right. You need to have three times LTV to uh, 1x uh, CAC cost. And in that ratio ensures profitability of the business. But the, the challenge here is that, you know, we can throw these metrics around all day and we have all sorts of different ways to calculate uh, a lot of these different things. But when you look at lifetime value, the challenge here is that lifetime value is a lagging indicator. Right. So you you don't really know when a customer comes in the door, you, you know what it's kind of you know what it's costing you to bring them in, but you don't really know how long they're going to stay. And so the retention side of the house, the lifetime value, the upsell, cross sell, um, you know, all that lifetime value stuff is pretty vague because you do, it takes so long to develop. It can take, you know, 12 to 18 months to really know, and especially if you're if you're a B2B company and you're you know, you're selling on contracts. Right. You you know, the lifetime value, you're, they're locked in for a year. Um, so the problem with lifetime is that it's a lagging indicator. And what you need to have is leading indicators, right? That tells you if you're on the right track or not. Because it's all about learning speed. How fast can I, how fast can we learn as a company? Um, and that always, that always comes down to how we're measuring, right? You get what you measure. So when you think about acquisition costs, one of the things to really focus on um, is called the payback period. And payback period is how long it takes to actually, this is a J curve. So how long it takes to actually recuperate your acquisition costs. This is kind of when you're when you're truly at the break even point for on, on that per customer basis. So the payback period, there's a standard, you know, uh, in a subscription company, there are standards for this as well. Um, you want to be you want to be less than 12 months, absolutely less than 12 months on your payback period. Payback period is how long it takes to to recoup that, and what you really want to focus on doing is shortening shortening that up and getting to break even on that customer a lot faster. That can mean changing your offer. That can mean um, you know pay up front uh, with a guarantee. That can mean a bunch of different things. Reducing acquisition acquisition costs. There's ways to think about how do we acquire customers that become profitable much sooner? So payback period is one really, uh, really good way. There's a whole bunch of other, other metrics, but this is an example of uh, good thinking on investor level metrics. There's also burn to growth ratio and stuff that we're not gonna cover now. Um, but what we're gonna talk about is how do I go from investor level metrics down to product team metrics that we can actually um, be tactical with. Because there's a strategy you have up here, but in order to succeed at that, you have to get to really good team execution. And so um, there's there's a gap there that we're gonna talk about. So when you come back and think, you know, it was unit economics, we come back and think about the funnel. I'm sure you, you're, you're familiar with, um, with this pirate metrics model in some, in some way. Um, in, if we think of this funnel as a system, then the theory of constraints says that in any one system, there's always one and only one bottleneck in the system at, at one time. So you see on the marketing side on the left, product on the right, let's say that right now our current bottleneck is in activation, right? Like marketing is pulling people, you know, we got MQLs coming, but they're really not even signing up, they're not downloading, they're not uh, installing it, they're not whatever, right? So activation is really getting them to engage and getting them to, to start using the product, maybe building those habits, right? Um, just starting to get in and get a taste uh, 
for the value of your product. If that's the if that's where the constraint is, and your team is going to work there, and they're able to solve for that, the challenge is that the bottleneck doesn't just disappear; it moves. Right. So when you when you previously had an activation problem because people weren't actually installing it or downloading it or getting past the the onboarding. Well, now you, now you have a whole bunch of people on your product, but they're not staying. They're churning. They're leaving right away. They don't come back the next week. And you actually naturally now have a retention problem. So these are some high level things to think about. Uh, they should be thinking about from a business perspective on the, the, the key question for you is, hey, in my company, right? When I think of my business as a system, where is the bottleneck currently? And uh, where was it before? Where is it now? And if I solve for that, what's the next bottleneck, right? Am I, am I operationally constrained? Am I acquisition constrained? And am I... Uh, retention constraint in this case, right? These are the types of, of lenses that you want to be thinking about from the business perspective. Again, the other the challenge with retention is that it's also a lagging indicator. You don't know that, that they're going to, you know, when they leave, um, you know, you don't know what led up to that. You don't know why. You don't know um, what are the what are the things I should have measured to get deeper and zoom into this further, right? This is such a high level view that it's not actual for your team. So if we come and actually look at it a different way, that's going to be pretty important. Do you notice that the way we were just looking at it with the funnel is, is looking at it from a business perspective, right? It's kind of like inside our four walls, this is how we're viewing things, looking out into, into the world. But what we want to do in customer-led model, what we actually want to do is spin that around and actually look at your business from the outside, from the outside looking in. Right. So whose perspective is that? That's your customer's perspective. That is the most important thing we feel that you can do um, really to get the growth you need. And, and it also applies to how you actually get the metrics set up for your teams. So if you start to look at life, not just from your funnel perspective, which is your side, start looking at it from the customer's perspective. It starts to look like this. So this is the buyer's journey. The buyer's journey starts with, um, you know, urgency. You know, a lot of people actually aren't even in urgency. They're even to the left of that where they're they're dormant or they're just limping along with whatever whatever solution they have or, you know, we'll solve it ourselves. Right. Um, so getting the urgency and understanding when people actually buy, what are those trigger events? What causes demand right in the market? What causes someone to actually have enough pain that they're actually willing to go shopping? Right. That's urgency. Understanding that's critical. Then selecting. Right. Actually, you know, doing doing actively doing demos. This is when they probably come into your sales funnel um, and, and differentiation and positioning. And those things are super, super important because the customer is navigating the market. They're trying to put you in a product category. They're trying to understand where you fit, how you're different. Um, this is all really important. This is the this is the buyer's journey. Right. Then from there. Um, they step into your product and, you know, onboarding, they might not have even fully committed to you yet. They still might be just trying you out, especially if you're product led um, or if you do some kind of some kind of trial, uh, try before you buy. Just because they're onboarding doesn't mean they're committed. Right. So understanding each customer and and what they might be trying a couple different products at one time to see, hey, they might be doing a, a you know, due diligence or tech spike or something like that to figure out uh, which one of these should I actually go with. Um, so so they go through onboarding. Then, they, of course, they get into like the real core value. And this is the this is where we deliver, you know, all of the promise that we've we've. Um, uh, been doing in our in our sales sales process and obviously support if they need help to, to reach out. And that's how they get to their desired outcome. So that's the buyer side of things. That's how we want you to think about the business. If we if we zoom in a little further, just to the product side, so kind of like taking marketing out for a moment, and we're just looking at the product itself. You know, of course, onboarding core product support. But this isn't enough. We have to go one level deeper. We can't just stay at this level. It actually looks like this. So the customer's journey isn't just these major sections. Oh, it's onboarding. Oh, it's you know this part of the part of the experience. It's actually 
much more nuanced than that. It's actually when we get down to the customer behavior level, that's when we really, really start to get to the good stuff, right? It's all about customer behavior change, right? Whether you're trying to um, to sell some sell something new or in the sales process or get them to a certain point to use a certain feature that you think is valuable or to help them see that value the customer is actually going through these micro steps um, and those micro steps it's actually uphill right like they have to climb uh if we were to visualize this separately we probably actually tilt this uh so it's it's a hill climb right because getting to that value getting to that outcome that we promised them it's not free to them it costs them even it costs them dollars sure but there's effort right i've got in my onboarding i've got to check this out customer will register with email okay so they got to do that okay i've got to register okay that's not a big deal but they still have to do it customer will create their profile they've got it in this in this onboarding experience hey they've got to probably upload some data to you for to to get this thing to work right like it's an uphill thing they have to actually put in the effort they have to elicit these behaviors to be successful with your product to actually get the the promise that they're buying so customer will register will create their profile customer will create their first project right set it up um and then maybe you know we get to this point in the in the onboard experience where it's like they get this aha moment, this magic moment, we call it, right? So the thing to think about right now is what magic moments exist in your product. A magic moment is something when somebody gets an emotional high, right? Something that's memorable, something that where, they, where, they, where their, their eyes light up and say, and say to themselves, that, like, I get it now. Like, this is it. This is why I bought the product, right? These magic moments, I mean, you can think about like your first kiss or your first car, right? Or any, you know, graduating from something, Th those, those highlight moments. Now we might not be to that level of emotion in someone's life, but, but you are creating em emotional peaks. And that's the kind of uh, thing you want to get to in your product really, really early on. And that is why, you know, uh, uh, onboarding in product led and, and any experience is, is so important. So these magic moments, because not every, not every one of those moments is equal. Some moments have much more emotional value and you want to get to that way early. So, Magic moments, think about which ones in your product create that like I light up thing. Uh, we call those hero screens, getting to getting to that. Challenge is, is you have to be able to measure these things. And if you're not measuring them, you really don't know where people are at. So let's say I've measured this and um, a lot of this, the, the, this, this customer segment is getting green, green, no problem. So everyone's getting past these first couple steps. But then I look at my analytics and I find out that, oh man, a lot of people are actually not getting this far. I, and and there, a lot of people are definitely not getting to the magic moment, right? Maybe the effort's too high. Maybe there's too much, too much friction in, in the way or whatever it is. I don't really know the problem, but, uh, but there is a problem here. And so you have to be able to have the analytics to even know this is happening. But then this is an opportunity now for your team to, to go to work. But the thing to realize is that it's not, you don't just have one customer journey, and one magic moment. You probably have multiple personas and multiple journeys. If you're in B2B, um, you probably have multiple personas. You know, you already have it if you have a buyer and a user. I mean, there's two right there. There's probably some reporting aspect. There's probably some day-to-day -day aspect. If you have multiple people, um, you actually have multiple journeys and multiple different magic moments at different times. And so this actually becomes um, a lot to really for your, for your product team to uh, product teams to grapple with, right? You have to be able to know your customers deep enough to know segmentation. You have to know what, what they're, where they are, where they're trying to go. What are those individual steps along the customer journey that we're expecting them to take? What steps are they actually taking? Are we instrumenting that right? Do we even know where the bottleneck is? Again, we're not trying to fix it yet. We're just trying to identify where are people, right? Where are people getting hung up? So this then allows you to, to move forward. Once you kind of, once you have these, um, this understanding of where people are at, then we can actually zoom in. This is an opportunity now for us to say, okay, we're gonna focus on this magic moment. This is where a lot of people aren't getting to this in our onboarding. This is where we're gonna have our teams focus.
This is where everything changes for, for your product team is you're able to zoom in here and say, hey, we're going to actually attack this head on. This is where, gonna, where we're, our team's going to make impact, right? And you'll notice that we're actually starting to build our metrics around individual behaviors. This could be time to value. Um, in the product, you could measure, you know, they have to get in here to this point within the first 10 minutes, the first 30 minutes, right? If it takes two weeks to get to this point with all these reminder emails, eh, probably not delivering the, the the magical emotional high we want, right? So we have to be able to measure time is one thing, but also behavior. If this is where we're going to make impact in that journey, then we have to be able to say, what's the effectiveness today? And let's say that in this example, you know, the behavior is that when they see that first data visualization, if this is a visualization of some kind, when they first see that, that's when their eyes light up like, wow, this thing, this is awesome. I definitely want to continue with this. But only 20% of people are even seeing that, right? So you're not really giving your product even a chance if they're not even getting to that point. So how do you go from 20%, maybe let's say we set, a, we set an OKR, we set a product metric uh, to go to actually 80%. If we can get 80% of people, uh, not just people, but this customer segment and this persona through to this, to see this first data visualization in the first, you know, 30 minutes of their experience, we know it's going to have a huge impact on our growth, right? It's going to have a huge impact on our retention. It's going to have a huge impact in, in a lot of ways and in their ability to share it with others, and us to go deeper in these, uh, uh, within these accounts. So you see what we kind of did here and I'll, I'll, I'll pause, but what we've done is we've gone from what are the business level metrics, the investor level metrics at a high level that we can use. Um, you want to be using with your with your investors, and there's a lot of those, and that's a different topic for another another uh, conversation. But then, how do you go from that, identifying where the bottleneck is in your um, in your funnel? to flipping down into the actual journey and understanding at a customer's perspective from the outside looking in. What's their life look like? What are the behaviors they're, they're, they're actually taking? What are the behaviors we want them to take? Where are they stuck? Are we instrumenting those appropriately? Picking those magic moments, zooming in and saying, where are they now? Where do we want them to be? And this is where your team can go to work. And what Andrew is going to be able to talk to next is how this changes everything. So, Andrew, I'll probably hand it over to you. Unless we have any comments, we can, we can pause for that if you'd like. Yeah, let's see if we have any any comments or questions that that come in. Um, I think it's easy, you know. We talk about this a lot, like getting data from your customers. Like <laughs> we talked about um, understanding behavior in the app, right? We talk a lot about you know being customer led in the sense that we're customer centric. We're so what does that mean? That means that we're watching what people do, right? We're observing what they actually do, and then we're going to talk to them and figure out why they didn't do what we think we you know, they would do what, why our experiment was wrong, why they didn't move to the next step, why they dropped out of the process and understand the why and understand how they're, you know, what are they thinking or what are they feeling? What do they expect would happen? And that's where like the intersection of kind of user research, UX jobs, like all these different things try to give us more Intel to figure out, okay, how do we make this better? Right. One way to look at it would be, um, purely from a product sense to say, Hey, people are dropping off on this part. We, we just need to implement this brand new feature. Hey, we just need to make it easier. We need, instead of that sign on, we need like one click sign on and just assume that if you introduce less friction in an onboarding experience or an activation experience, that that's going to translate to more value. But we, what we really understand is that you, you can't stop there. Those ideas are good. You have to go to your customers and understand what expectations they had or what their motivation was or how the messaging spoke to them in a way where they realized this actually isn't for me anymore. Right. And so taking these metrics, I think to the next level, which we'll, we'll talk about in a minute to be able to come back through um, what your customers are doing um, I think is really, really important. Yeah. I think that, you know, we're talking today, the topic today is, you know, getting to the right product metrics. But the, the thing that we always talk about is that, the metrics tell you what's happening, but it doesn't answer why, right? You, I have no idea by looking just, just at the analytics, why people are falling off, what the perception of my product is, what, you know, what they, you know, even if they're the right customer segment, mm -hmm. I, I really have no idea who they are. All I have is an email address and, and a profile, you know? Um, so, so Andrew is totally right that really it's about, this is just the quant side 
but the quant side doesn't answer, won't actually help you get to, um, to improving these things, right? You actually have to get deep with your customers. There, you know, the human side is, is where, uh, is where all the insight that allows you to improve these metrics uh, comes into play. And that's why we think customer led a view of things, viewing things from the customer's perspective, their buying journey, not just you looking out, but, but the customer looking in is really going to be important and you going deep with your customers to improve these metrics. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. And, and, and when we think about getting more Intel or getting more data on, you know, on what customers are doing, feeling, right? There's one side of it, which is we're kind of measuring it from a UI and a journey standpoint, right? Through our app, we're understanding, you know, the touch points that they have. There's also like the technical observability. Hey, is the data that was served up actually served up when we get to server rendered views and we get to things that are, you know, a technical uh, issues that aren't just painting HTML on a page. You think of Lightstep, you think of OpenView, some other telemetry companies that will help you understand if like, was this a tech issue or was this actually something with the UI, right? You'd be able to understand that. And then using product and, and using really our ability to go talk to people, understand that why and kind of paint a full picture of, hey, is our, is our tech stack secure? Is our UI and the experience through the journey good? Is it speaking to the right problems? Is it helping uncover the right motivations for them to continue in the flow? And then, um, you know, having real conversations with customers, which is what we'll get into here um, as we think about, um, you know, talking about empowered teams. And um, a lot of this, you know, really stems from silos that we see at, at growing organizations and even in some companies where you start out really small um, and you start to grow. And by default, you get these departments that have to occur, right? Because you have career development, you have um, reporting structures, you have things like that where you're focused on keeping like people together. And as we move towards product teams, it's really about creating more of a structure around a shared vision, uh, a specific vision, an outcome, a mission with common goals, so that you can break apart just this skill-specific um, hierarchy and actually put that team together you know, on a mission, right? It's like deploying the infantry with the air team, with um, you know, the generals, with everyone together, you're kind of, you're actually, going from like deploying a tactical team into deploying a strategic team that can make choices and can make decisions and ha really ha has this way where they can make principles um, become a reality or use principles to become a reality and focus on your customers. And so when you bring those teams together, that's where you really start to see um, a lot of progress and actually, you know, where you actually have the ability to take ownership over a metric or over, over something, right? If, you know, it's easy to say, Hey, I'm in, you know, I'm a developer. I'm working on this thing. I can't impact, you know, how this design looks or what this looks like. If you're in a silo and it's, you know, we talk about this a lot in a lot of our design and dev videos is like, rather than a handoff, have it be a handshake. And a lot of these concepts really all tie together where it's about making sure that we're passing information and insights along from different team members to, to one another to make ultimately a better product and a better experience in the long run, you know, for our customers. So thinking about going away from departments and when you get on specific teams, aligning those product teams. And one of the things we talked about, uh, Ryan, Ryan touched on is like the recognition that there's different, even if you have the same customer type, the job they're coming to you with could be different. And that can make all the difference in how much your team understands and empathizes with what, um, what they're going through and also impacts whether or not they can actually make a decision on how to improve it. So as you think about, you know, customers and having a person to serve, as you think about a job or a specific problem they're trying to solve and building these out, right? The, the things that we assume to solve them, a lot of people stop at features or we'll do feature teams, ultimately platform teams, right? Hey, we have a mobile team. Um, we have a web team and we've, we've talked about this before, but all of those things are, essential if you're going to scale up your organization. And, and a lot of teams may have kind of a layering of a platform team that, that may mix with a feature team that applies to that job across many, many customers, just depends on how you slice your company. Um, and also how that experience changes over time. But usually a, a really good rule of thumb is to um, 
align people and align metrics around specific customers and problems that you're solving, because those two things will help kind of create those commonalities that you need to, to create alignment on your team and also have a clear, a clear enough picture to make those decisions. And this kind of aligns with, um, you know, Simon Sinek's start with why is like, who are we serving and, and why do they, why do they come to our product, right? What are they looking to our product to do? And kind of brings in jobs theory of like, what are they, what progress are they trying to make? Why would they hire our product versus, you know, someone else to do it? Or um, why would they not do it at all? Like, why is it so important, you know, in the features and how we do it in the platform in what we do. And so, you know, going back to, to this, like when we think about creating and structuring product teams, it's aligning them around customers and jobs. And so you can really build a lot of empathy. And also you have, you, you, as I mentioned before, you now have this understanding where you can make decisions around how to improve the experience or what you should say, right? If somebody came through, um, let's say in onboarding and we were seeing a drop off and we didn't have a cross-functional team around a customer who would say, well, who knows what this customer cares about? Then we go and talk to the marketing team. We might go talk to the insights team and say, Hey, do we have a profile on you know, this type of customer? Like we're getting hung up here and we think it might be because of the messaging or it's not clear um, design things. It's because, Hey, if we just, you know, implemented this one click, uh, this one click a activation that they would walk through the door and it, it would work, but really that team doesn't have what they need to make those decisions. And so when you think about um, multi-platform, uh, or multi marketplaces where you have multiple sides, you usually will have a lead in each who kind of brings that empathy for that or, or an insights lead and then brings it down where you would have a product manager or a product strategist who really is part of that customer team who's part of that and, and can kind of bring it, you know, forward. So coming back to, you know, kind of full circle to product teams, it's, being able to align these teams with different skill sets and then bring them together on a mission and really a mission around a specific metric or a specific goal or a specific key result that they're marching towards. And you end up with something that's more of a matrix organization where you have these cross-functional teams with leads and you also have, you know, still the, the needs of your department in strategy and design development, because everyone on your team at a startup wants to elevate you know, or has specific career goals. And there's still ladders within this, within your individual roles, but this really is a, is a really effective way to bring all that alignment and keep decision-making inside of that team versus up and down a ladder. And, and when we think about um, moving it forward, it's about, it's, it's about ultimately moving away from permission to, to do certain things um, and really empowering those teams. And so when we think about that team and in, in, in the same con concept can be true um, of this team where you, you're cross-functional, you have all the, all the pieces you need to be effective to be like this self-sufficient, self-healing team um, that you can overcome things, but you could still end up being a feature team. So even if you get the structure right, the principles that guide your team or the, um, the different environments that they're working in can affect how effective those people are, right? And so feature teams, they get features to build, um, stakeholders prioritize it and decide. They're really there to design and code, right? And hey, we're gonna keep things moving smoothly and we care a lot about velocity. Um, we're not really involved in discovery of what customers need. We're, we're kind of told what, um, what they want either from a visionary in the org or, you know, from, you know, Hey, the customers, you know, I think a good, a good example of these feature teams is we let sales dictate what features get built and pass on to these teams. So sales goes and has a conversation and they come back and they say, Hey, um, you know, team, <laughs> team a, um, if we build this, they're going to convert. Can we get on the roadmap today? Because I want to close them next week. Right. And then your entire roadmap, gets pushed out for whatever you're building um, really just focus on schedule and deliveries. And, and ultimately these feature teams aren't accountable for results because they have no responsibility over it. There's no priority placed on it. They don't have any ability to impact it because it's all dictated down to them from other places. Um, I think the biggest thing is that your team waits for direction. They're the ultimately ticket takers and there's less fulfillment, right? When you can't use, you know, a, a lot of people either get into entrepreneurship or tech to make an impact. And when you feel like you can't use your abilities to do that, and you're just kind of 
hands and feet and you can't use your brain at all. Um, that's a red flag, right? You see a lot of teams churn because we're not giving our team the abilities or the, the availability to make the impact that they want or the growth opportunities to become more strategic and add, you know, add that strategic piece on top of what they're doing tactically. And a lot of these feature roadmaps, um, a, a good way to look at, um, or analyze a feature team is just to look at how long the feature roadmap is. Are things planned out, you know, for the next six, 12 months pretty granularly, or is there, or is there, you know, something that's a little bit different and I'll go, I'll jump to this empowered team roadmap where you have varying areas of discovery and delivery, and you also are not looking that far ahead. Right. But you have, um, and we'll go over the loops, uh, the continuous impact loop in our next office hour, but essentially, you have four phases of product and, you know, product development and customer development, um, you know, over the next couple of months where you might only have two to three sprints ahead planned that kind of goes through those iterations in an empowered team, you know, and this is, this is what we suggest the, the thing here is like, you need really great people, right. And you need to be able to trust those people. So you need to give them the right training. You need to give them the right mentality, the right principles, and you need to be able to trust that they're going to make the right decisions or be able to get to the right spot. And I think a lot of teams struggle with delegation. They struggle with, you know, being able to hire, you know, high enough <laughs> caliber of people to be able to hand it off and really empower their team to go, to go run and um, solve problems. So, you know, some of the key attributes here is they're getting problems to solve. They're partnering with stakeholders. There's, there's more of a consultative, um, you know, more recommendations being made, less just, you know, to hand to mouth, um, you know, taking tickets and running. They're there to discover the best, the best way to solve the problem right? And, and figure that out. Um, they're involved in that product discovery. Um, they act as a CEO of the product. They focus on the value and the viability of the things that they're building. They're accountable for results measured by value and outcomes. And ultimately they're on a mission together. And, and that mission has meaning because they have a goal to achieve, right? They know that um, there's at least a milestone flag, you know, for them to be able to iterate and chase after. And I think, a lot of creativity comes from constraints and also comes from those, um, you know, those key results that we're, that we're getting after. The good thing about these teams is they're data driven. They're always in motion. They're able to take ownership. And as I mentioned before, there's more meaning and fulfillment because you get to show up and not just use your uh, hard skills, but use your soft skills and, and, you know, be more creative around how you solve certain things. But the, the thing that still comes down um, is, you know, what, what Ryan was talking about is key metrics that get pulled out of, you know, pulled out of it. That's usually one level up um, from this team, or maybe co-created with the team saying, Hey, you know, we have these different opportunities. Where could we help make the most impact? And I think ultimately, you know, that gets to this continuous impact loop, which we'll get to in our next, you know, in our next session, you can go watch um, continuous discovery and delivery in the ready to scale series online. Um, but we'll have, we'll have John who's in the video. We'll have Billy who's also in the video really just to have a good conversation around the best way to empower your team and ultimately build more closer with your customer, learn more about what they're doing, um, their perception and, and really ultimately help them make progress faster. Um, and so as we move in, into, you know, this loop with continuous discovery and delivery, most teams will do discovery once, right? They'll, they'll do it at the beginning of an effort or they'll do initial validation. And then when it's time to build, they just build, they don't come back through, you know, with, with customers. And specifically what we're talking about here is more mature mid-stage companies that are maybe series a plus where, you know, you're, you need to integrate insights ongoing. Um, cause I think there is a, you know, it's easy for us to validate early on, um, with customers and then go build and, and create like pilot programs, right. And, and be able to do discovery and delivery as we go. And, and some teams graduate out of those pilot programs where they're, Hey, they finally have a public release that's available. They have a sales team. They have, um, those things in place. Now they just move to delivery and execution and say, Hey, we know what customers want, but the reality is that like 
your expectations of your customers change, everything changes as time goes on, right? Your product is staying the same. You're not meeting them where they're at. New competitors are in the space, all those things. Um, so next time we'll talk more about this con uh, continuous impact loop, which is all around, you know, a specific process that you could use to apply, you know, to your product roadmaps, exploring, prototyping, piloting, and ultimately scaling up those efforts, all being, you know, extremely close to your customer, co-creating to a sense um, where you're, you're bringing really the best in discovery and the best in, in delivery together. So that's um, kind of the, the end of, you know, what we're talking about here with empowered teams is really, you know, making sure one, you have the structure in place, two, you have the principles, and, and three, you have a metric that you're able to give them. And, but without what Ryan talked about, without all those details and understanding one, the different customers we have two the different journeys they're on and the things they're hiring us for and three, like where they're getting stuck, we can't give a metric to a team, right? So these problems kind of build upon each other where we have too many customers, we have too many jobs we're helping them with, you know, we're letting them do whatever they want with our product to try and achieve what they're doing. And we're happy just taking in the revenue. But if you're looking to grow and scale, you need to, you know, get your house in order to say, Hey, what are people doing today? How are they being successful and really build upon that. And only when you have the data and, and you have a way to continuously derive insights from what people are doing and, and how they're thinking and feeling, then you can bring this metric forward and empower the team. But without, kind of all those building blocks, it's very hard to, to be effective really. Yeah, it was super good. I think the people underestimate the impact of setting a metric, right? Like we talk about the building blocks and, and, and this leads to that. Like it's a domino effect and get, to get to this point where your teams can really run, if you want to really empower your teams, it's going to take a leadership change. I think the, the, the challenge is as a founder early on, you know, you're the closest to the, to the metal. You're the closest to the market. You understand stuff really, really well, really deeply. But as your team grows, you're going to have to um, let go and, and, and the willingness to be, to be wrong. Because a lot of times we see there's different ways that different pressures that are influencing these product teams, right? Like Andrew mentioned, uh, sales, sales is pressuring the product team to hey, add this feature in because I need to sign this contract. And, you know, it's con this contract's conditional on this, right? So we're, we're putting features in contracts. That's sales-led. Um, another, another one is founder-led, founder-led influence, right? Where it's the founder has just got this, this passionate vision and, and but really not, not taking into account the actual market, right? So founder-led can go really askew and really wrong. And you might, be, you, might be, you might be onto something in the beginning and people might buy into that vision, but, but there's a point where you're, you know, your customers are going to outpace your understanding and you don't, you don't, that's going to fall short. There's other ways to influence your team competitor led, right? Sometimes it's, it's a, it's a me too or copycat. Hey, this feed, this competitor has this, we've got to add that. And it becomes a, uh, like a check the box, you know, in your, on your website for the, for the comparison grid. Right. So there's all these different ways that your teams can be influenced on, on what to build. Um, but we think the best way, the right way is actually metrics based um, that allows your team to be, to be autonomous, that allows your team to be cross-functional and make their own decisions within that team. So it's, it's these two things that are, that are really built together. It's the structure of your organization and your willingness as a founder um, to actually create space for your product teams to, to do the problem solving. Right. If you're just coming in with the magic answer and here's the bucket, just carry it across the room. You know, it's not it's not going to get your team excited and you could be wrong, especially if, I mean, if you have multiple product teams like you can't handle that. You let the teams handle that kind of complexity. So autonomous teams is something we're really passionate about. But in order to enable that, you have to be able to know what should the teams be working on. Right. The simple answer is the really simple way to do it is. Here's a feature, you know, go work on that, go work on that. But, but then what you're doing is um, you're not allowing your teams to actually go for impact and, and the best talent actually wants to chase impact. Right. So um, if you want to actually get to the growth, get to the growth numbers and, you know, you need to go from the business level metrics 
down to product level metrics. And that's what connects these two is being able to, to understand your customers at a really, really deep level, letting your teams do that, um, understanding where people are stuck in their journey, building a metric around that, and then letting your, setting your teams free to actually go chase these individual theme, uh, uh, types of problems. Some of the examples that we've talked about um, that Andrew mentioned in this matrix org is, you know, in the customer why visual is you could have one team focused on one persona, another team focused on a, a different persona. Simple way to do it is in a two, two-sided marketplace. You got, you got essentially two teams, one owns each type of customer, right? Um, another one is, you know, we see a lot of people organize their teams around technology, right? I have a, a, a mobile team and, and, and a web team and a backend team, and that's not all bad. Like we understand that, that, that needs to, that needs to happen, but who's actually, you know, who's on the customer team, if you will, right? Who's actually owning the customer experience. Uh, what you'll see is, is that the customer experience will reflect your org structure. And if your org, if you're, if you have these teams all separate, it's going to be a really jagged experience. So what you really want to do is, is have your teams kind of couple around um, uh, a customer and, and a specific problem set, specific part of the journey, perhaps. Um, maybe you have an onboarding team that just makes onboarding awesome across all your different platforms, web, mobile, whatever, right? Email, um, all of that. And, and you want to be able to know is how do I know if that team's successful at setting up the right product metrics, putting the right people on that team and giving the team space to, to, to succeed. And that's kind of what we mean by, by empowered teams, as opposed to, as opposed to these feature teams. I actually have one question I wanted to ask. Uh, I'll share it up on the screen here. What are common mistakes when it comes to product analytics and what teams should take action on? Like, what are things that you've seen people do when it comes to like either setting them up, looking at them, analyzing them? Like, how do you, what do they do with them? What that's usually wrong. I have a, I have a couple that come to mind. Like one of them is like just setting things up and being like, oh, we have amplitude installed or we have our process, you know, metered, but not actually, or we have our product metered, but not actually have a process to come back and review that and actually derive enough insights out of it, right? Where it's like, hey, they set it up and they check the box and yeah, we, you know, we know what people are doing. The next one that's really big is um, Ryan, you know, and Ryan mentioned it in kind of our approach, but bucketing all of your customers together and treating them as one and just looking at one customer journey and saying, oh, well, everybody's struggling with onboarding. Right. You don't you miss the nuance in that. So by being able to divide out your customers by type or, you know, you know, at least one dimension will help give you more insights on, OK, well, how do we make an impact here? How do we actually improve this? Because not every user is going to be struggling with the same thing. Right. Depending on their level of motivation or the problem we're helping them solve in the product their motivation could be different. So they might be willing to go over more friction because it's more valuable to them. And that's part of why finding like your best, you know, the best customers for you can help you uncover more value to say, Hey, even though this is a bad experience from a UX perspective, all of these types of customers are being successful. That means we could either charge them more. We could, you know, figure out like, do we build our business on that? So I think those two come to mind of underutilizing your analytics when they're actually set up and then, just treating every everything as one, you know, one metric. Hey, onboarding, you know, stage one. This is the metric we have to fix it, and not kind of peeling that onion back. Yeah, and I'll just add to that. I think, you know, it's really easy, like Andrew said, to just, you know, add a JavaScript thing in and get get a stream of data going. And oh, look, I got a dashboard. And it's like, if you if you just look at it from that perspective, yeah, you can you can get some insight from it, but it's really not telling you what's the whole, the whole picture. And so you have to think about what's the actual customer experience. What's that customer experience. Are we measuring like the customer bill statements done? Dun, dun, dun. Are we measuring those things? And you know, what you'll find is, well, no, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't, we're not measuring that specifically, you know, cause that, that takes, well, devs got to instrument that a certain way or, um, well, it's in a different system. So now I've got to look at different systems. I got to look at uh, sales side, marketing side, you know, intercoms giving me different data, a lot of uh, data mismatch. So like, um, you know, uh, user IDs won't, won't match. So intercom does user IDs one way and like, 
you know, Mixpanel does it another way in, in my, my screen, screen capture software, um, you know, does it a different way. And so like, it's actually, it actually takes a lot of hard work to get your analytics set up correctly, just to be able to track the right things, identify the right person. Cause what you want to be able to do is be able to, to pull someone up. Cause you know, like Andrew said, it's, it just turns into mud when you're just looking at everybody, right? It's like the, the average is useless. Like it just gets muddy. So it's like, well, what's the average height of the average American? What's the average height of Americans? Like, that's not helpful. But, but you know, uh, average right. height well, of college well, basketball it, players is so different. Yeah. I was going to say using, you know, an average height of, you know, an American and like extrapolating that and be like, well, that must be the average height of basketball. Right. It'd be like, it'd be like assuming the height's the same because it's, Hey, everyone's a, you know, an American, but you have that one dimension ultimately changes like that average height. Right. And that's kind of what we're talking about when you think about if, you know, even one dimension will give you much more insight than the other. Right. And start to give you two different, you know, readings, which, which help you understand where to focus. Yeah, totally. And you know, you're you're, you're going to have some data in your, you know, backend database. Not all that data is going to be in your analytics, like segment and your event 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 pipeline. Like that's not going to be in there. So you have to know what are the different segments I want to be able to track. I have to actually surface that out of my events. Um, you know, so it is more complex. And that you what you want to be able to do is you want to be able to go from, you know, I want to okay, this one person had an issue. How do I investigate? How do I understand that? Or this one person made it really, really far in the experience, or they got there really faster than anyone else. What what happened? How do you want to replay that? You want to look at what they did, watch their screen, like all those things. Your analytics have to be connected correctly, um, is one thing. And then like the segmentation we talked about, but also how you improve and track your your uh, your metric, your, we would call it continuous impact metric over time is you have to be using not only segmentation, but also cohorts, right? So it's actually being able to see if this, if this segment is, is improving over time, week over week. And, and if we're tracking it too slow, then maybe we're just not getting the learning cycles we need, right? Hey, are we actually every two weeks, do we actually learn something new every week? Do we learn something new? Yeah. And the whole reason for cohorts is because, well, I'll just let wrap up with this. The whole reason for cohorts is because, you know, every, every week, every two weeks, however you're often you're delivering your marketing team's working on stuff. Your salespeople are trying different value prop and pricing. Your, your onboarding is different. Your support's changing all those things. So customers are experiencing a totally different experience, you know, every, every few months for sure. Awesome. I, I, the one thought I had too was like the, this data and analytics can show you what's happening, but then it doesn't always explain why it's happening. And that's where, right. Those, those like qualitative customer interviews, like, Hey, we're seeing a lot of this. If you have it segmented or maybe you don't, Hey, while we're seeing a lot of this, like I'm going to reach out to these, these customers. Cause I know they're stopping there. Like if you do have that data and like, you know, if you can get, get time with them, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever you can get, and be like, hey, I'm just curious. Like, I noticed you got here. I'm just wondering why you stopped, because that context can really. Because it's like the data is like again, the data shows the what, but it doesn't show the why. And I think it, a lot of people just you know aren't aren't talking to their customers, um, you know, at every step of the process, not just pre-purchase, but like you know as they're using the product, you know, a year later even just revisiting. Like, hey, just wonder if you're still using the product, if you're still enjoying it. Like if there's something you wish you had in here or like things you, you don't find useful at all. Right. Like it, I think that's uh, that that's very common where people lean too much into the, the analytics and not enough into the why of the analytics. But um, yeah, I just wanted to share that little, little thought there. Yeah. Any, yeah. Anything else from otherwise I think we can wrap up. I don't think so. I, I think there's a, you know, one thing we, we said as we were creating this video series is like, it's all connected and it really is. And, you know, where we started in, you know, with the go to market stuff is really like your customer and everything like permeates throughout that. And, and the farther you are away from your customer day to day, week to week, month to month, you know, in, in having actual interactions and understanding the context, the more you're going to feel those symptoms, right? You're going to feel, you're going to feel the churn. You're going to feel, you know, customers leaving. You're going to feel poor reviews. You're going to, everything else suffers when you don't understand the people you're serving. And so, 
you know, this whole goal is to one, get a baseline foundation in for how we can derive insights out of them and then create a process that we can continue to go back, you know, just as you would with a brand new venture. Like you want to talk to people, you want, like you want to bring them through this journey with you. You can iterate really quickly and actually have more impact, which is, I think, you know, the reason for the name of the continuous impact loop is like it can increase it. Cause if you don't do that, it becomes a tug and pull between who has a bigger title in the room, whose idea was this feature versus that feature. And you become a feature factory where you, you velocity is really high. You pump a lot of stuff out, but it doesn't make the change you want. It doesn't move the needle. It doesn't actually add more value to your customers and no one wants that. Right. Which is why it's the worst feeling in the world, you know, having, having been there um, to be on a feature team, to be taking orders from people who aren't really, empowering you to make decisions, to not have the metrics you need to actually figure out what you're trying to move and then not have your work ever see the light of day or make an impact, right? Like that's the world that a lot of product teams are in when they're not implementing something like this is you're feeling stuck that like, Hey, you're really good at design or development or, or, or strategy. You can't use the tools you have though. You're, you're kind of ticket taking and you, right. And that's what we're trying to get away from which is a win for your business. It's a win for your team and it's a win for customers. That's really the perfect scenario is help everybody come together, but it, it really starts with a mindset shift and then, you know, fundamentals of, you know, product instrumentation and then empowering your team. So, um, yeah, there, there's a lot of, a lot of good, um, you know, that can come from it. And the best teams you see that do this all the time are, you know, the team I always come back to since we use it um, and I'm designer, you know, by trade is Figma, like these really nuanced things. You can tell they're going through this sort of loop every single week with their customers and they release it. And it's all these little things as a designer where like you could put up with them, but it's the reason why people don't use Photoshop anymore. It's the reason why people don't use sketch anymore is because they're iterating so fast and making such an impact on a designers and even a, you know, dev teams day to day that they know that Figma is going to watch out for them in the future. I think that sort of like brand loyalty only comes when you get really close to your customers and you care more than them about it. Right. And I, I think like that's ultimately the experiences you're trying to create where people are raving about, you know, your product and using it every day and telling everyone they know. So Figma is like the most meta example because they use their own tool to prototype their own tool. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> and you, you only learn it by doing it by like one, they're users of it two by observing what other people are trying to do in different contexts. Mm -hmm. Oh, you need this padding thing. Oh, that's interesting. Right. Like, tell me more, like, show mm -hmm. me how you use that. Right. And it's all these like micro interactions that, that just make those magic moments always come right. Or they come up with a new release where it's like, Oh, I don't have to do this work around anymore. Mm hmm. Right. It's all these like moments of friction where, where they, they really, really understand it. That, that I think is, I mean, that's why they're, I don't know, multi-billion, $10 billion company or something crazy, but mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. Well, awesome. Well, we'll wrap things up here. Thanks everyone for, for hanging out with us today and, and talking about metrics and, and team structures and all that stuff. Uh, thank you to Ryan and Andrew for sharing your experience and wisdom with all of us today. Um, we'll have the recording up on the YouTube channel early, early next week. I usually do a couple quick edits. Um, oh, thanks, Aaron. Looks like Aaron Bison. Thank you for all the, all the information. Really useful. Keep up the good work. Awesome. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks for hanging out. Um, but yeah, so we'll, if you're, um, if you signed up for this event, we'll definitely send you a recording in the email, but otherwise just look out on our YouTube channel. Be sure to subscribe. We have our event uh, next week, or I should say next month uh, in July on the 6th, um, all about just continuous discovery and continuous delivery in those loops and how we'll have John, Billy and Ryan and Andrew. We're going to have like basically the whole, the whole uh, headway leadership team here talking about every aspect of product and, and how that all works together and how those teams like collaborate. So it'll be super exciting to have everyone here. So, uh, and yeah, if anyone has any questions, leave them in the comments below or shoot us an email at headway.io and go to our contact form and you can, you can send us a message there too. So awesome. Well, thanks everyone and uh, have a great week. Yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Later. Bye.